extended time. He's assisting me and helping me. He's one of the leaders in time and frequency. So, there are well, five speakers and one invited talk. So, since the time is running very fast and it's behind schedule, so may I personally request all the speakers to maybe very precise in their time. We'll try to give you indication two to three minutes before so that if we have a sufficient time, we can have a question answers. Otherwise, we can proceed during the next time for the discussion. So not taking much time, I start with the first invited talk, which is IT15 in the technical session five. And it's my pleasure to invite Professor Ravindra Agarwa from Thakur University. Dr. Ravindra Agarwa, please join us on the dais. A brief introduction for Dr. Professor Ravindra Agarwa. He is a professor and head in electrical and instrumentation engineering department, Thakur Institute of Engineering and Technology, Patiala. Dr. Agarwal obtained his PhD in 1991. Dr. Agarwal has about 24 years of teaching. His current area of his research interest includes biomedical instrumentation, environment monitoring instrumentation, sensor and transducer, rehabilitation devices, and sports coordination. I know Dr. Prof. Ravinder Agarwal when he was doing his PhD days, that was in 19. 87 or 88, if I remember this correctly. So he has grown up in a stretcher and he's one of the leaders in the area of instrumentation in India. And it's a pleasure to have him for the invited talk. So may I request of Mr. Ravinder to please enlighten us with your talk. And thank you. Thank you. I am very thankful to Mr. to give me an opportunity to interact and give a talk on uh, his topic. And I'm also thankful to the chair and co-chair for uh, being right for this uh, session. So today my talk will be on cognitive sports training to enhance the performance. Uh, first, a little bit towards this slide, just I will tell you about the institute. I am working at Thapar Institute of Engineering Technology since 1995. So this institute uh, started in 1956, and uh, thereafter it progresses like anything. And I joined Thapar University uh, in 1995. At that time, the institute was not very big, small. Uh, at that time, we had uh, the intake of about uh, 200 students. Now, at present, we have the intake of uh, more than 2,500 in every year. So the strength of the campus is more than 12,000 at present. So which includes uh, undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD programs, and so on. And also this university also helping in uh, doing good number of projects, uh, government funded from ASD, UGC, DRDO, CSI, and so on. So this institute, the building, uh, come up with the new, so within the last few years. So in my area, I am working in a number of areas. So in those areas, just I will briefly say, uh, the one of the area uh, where I am working is uh, on the sensors and disease diagnose system design. So here uh, we have designed some of the uh, instruments like uh, I was telling you in between as the expert, uh, about the rehabilitation. So there we were doing uh, the, uh, making the devices for the hand or for ankle leg. So those projects I have I done with the help of uh, support of uh, DSP. Another area uh, which is related to the environment. So again, uh, in the environment, I have contributed a little bit as for the uh, project uh, from the CSIR as well as uh, from the DSP as well as ICMR, we got the research project. So uh, every year we hear uh, on the new, from the newspaper as well as from the news channel that there is a problem of the 
permit matter pollution during uh, after Diwali and after Holi. So that is due to crop dust, due burning in the environment that creates problem uh, in the healing and exhaling. So those studies which we have done for different ages, for children, adults, and for uh, old people. So in the study, we found that the most affected persons out of that is children and the old people. So in the old people, definitely otherwise they were also uh, taking some problems. So it should create some more problems. So another area which where I am contributing is biomedical system design. In this case, the prosthetic devices, lower limb, human gait uh, analysis. Uh, so that is the part and physiological signal activation system. And the fourth one is related to the computational cognitive system. So this is related to our DRDO project, brain fingerprinting, and the enhancing the cognitive skills through the virtual environment, creating yoga and so on. So these are the four, uh, four areas where I have been working since last many years. So for that, uh, the expertise involved in those studies related to the circuit design, machine learning, embedded system, control system, mechanical structure, image processing and fabrication uh, followed by the characterization study. So the, now I'm coming to the main topic of the community study on the sport. So before uh, I start the, about telling you about the uh, sports cognition, first the cognition. The cognition refers to all the processes by which the sensory input is transformed, processed, stored, and recovered and used the feedback after analysis in a better way. So there are some aspects of the cognition related to the cognition, like the information processing, the mind acquired information from the environment, continuous processing, and they are stored and then analyzed. And the dynamic process like which is include uh, conceptual, theoretical, empirical knowledge, which influence the behavior and integrated <laughs> temporary information utilized in existing information and in new learning area. So in case of the cognition in sports, so which is required to make the correct decision making at the spot. Time is short and we have to make the right decision. So that is the skill testing at that time. So the purpose is to gather the information over the visual field area. Uh, by how? By paying the attention to several members of the opposition as well as the teammates during the critical phase of play. So we have the like football team. So we have the uh, friend, our uh, team, that is the target, and we have the team from the opposition, that is the destructor. So that definitely play important role. So keep in mind everything, we have to take the decision and we have to proceed further. Now, after the community study, we have the two areas where we can study and analyze the data that how the skills are improved. So one is expert, people playing from number of times. The other side is unknown, not playing or sometimes, okay. So from the diagram expert, from the expert side, we can see the expertise. We can stack the things, the knowledge in a sequence way. Whereas for the other case, so we'll see the destruction. So that creates problem. The expert performance approach is used. So by using the number of activities. So here I'm showing the sports specific skills. So in this case, the visual cue, uh, pattern calls, visual search, strategies, knowledge of situational probabilities. The probabilities, you never know what kind of probability, what kind of situation will occur at that time. So according to that, we have to take decision uh, to help. So in this case, what is important? Important is attention, working memory, reaction time, and then the speed, how quickly we can act. So this cognitive training starts. So cognitive training start means related to brain activity. So a program to regular activities is supported to maintain or improve one's cognition skill. So in this case, uh, it is used to enhance the cognitive skill like attention, working memory, so which is the important parameter which helps to turn the inactive brain cells into active ones. So we have to activate by some activities. So that gives the, uh, that support us in focusing during that game which help to overcome the cognitive load. Now for the measurement, so one is the old methods by which we can make or ensure 
that the people, the person who is participating is focused or diverted. So for that, the easy way is one is psychological test and the other is the uh, instrumental method. So in the instrumental case, we used to go use the EEG physiological signal measurement. So all cognitive processes held in the brain, the EEG, that is EEG is electroencephalogram. So like that, we have the number of grams like uh, uh, for the muscles, for brain, for other, for eye. So there are number of uh, uh, electrograms which are used. So here I am concentrating on EEG, electroencephalograms. So EEG is the seat of all the cognitive processes. So that is related to brain. So the stealth recording of electrical activity of cortex is done in this case. And the signal which is picked up from the brain with the help of the device. So that signal is very, very low intensity in microvolts. So the role of the EEG is to identify the natural correlation and diagnose the initial uh, sleep disorder, anesthesia, coma, and so on. So now let us come a little bit about the physiology that I am not going in the detail. So according to the physiology, so we have uh, the axon, then the signal, how it moves from one point to another point. And after that, moving to the spinal cord, and after that, it will reach to the brain, and after that, the uh, analysis, and then the action starts. So in this process, EEG, so there are a number of figures, okay, so which help us in the analysis part. So at different situations, uh, first we should know what are the uh, levels of frequency, amplitude, when we put the electrode on the scalp, the signal will come. So to identify those things, so those signals will come and we have to an analyze by using different classifiers and so on. So here, uh, some of the signals which I am showing is like the beta waves. Uh, in this uh, frequency spectrum, uh, it varies from 12 to 30 hertz and the amplitude is 5 to 50 microvolt signals. And uh, it helps in the problem solving, learning, attention, whereas the alpha, it varies in the range of frequency 8 to 12 hertz, and the amplitude range is 5 to 120, and theta 4 to 8 hertz, and the amplitude is 2200 microvolts, and delta is 5 to 4 hertz, and uh, the amplitude it varies from 5 to 250 microvolts. So when the person is active and the person is sleeping and so on, so on the basis of that, the spectrum is designed and uh, which is followed. And uh, these um, basics which are being taught to the student in the engineering level in instrumentation. Now, to pick up the signal from brain. So the standard system, 1020 electrode system is used. This is a very defined, very system, uh, very rugged system, which is used and ensured that the placement of the electrodes. Because at the step, at there are number of points, we have to take care if you're where we are putting the electrodes. So as per the protocols, we have to put the electrode on those defined locations and we we'll, uh, pick up the signal and there are the analysis part will start. And for recording, we have to use minimum two electrodes. One is the bio electrodes, which are connected to each other. And the second is the reference electrode. Now the type of cognitive training methods, so which is categorized into two categories. So, one is a conventional method and second is non-conventional. In the conventional method, you have the physical exercise, sports exercise, videos, simulation, and so on. Whereas in the other case, non-conventional uh, methods, you have the mental training. So for the mental training, some program has to be designed. And after uh, clearing that the design program, training program, so that person is qualified. And after that, some more tests are conducted to, to ensure the improvement in the skills and so on. Now for the training, uh, multiple object training from the, so in this case, so I will tell you about the 15 level of uh, uh, where the skill drug program is done and the factors affecting the performance it has to do. So in the multiple object tracking, MOT, so here in the uh, diagram you can see the two colors of balls green and blue. So initially these balls are stable for the five seconds and after that these balls will move for 10 seconds 
and convert it in one color. So this one color and this one color. So when it is coming to the second stage, so all the colors are of same color. In the third, when it is stable, we have to tell which one was green. So it means continuously we have to watch and we have to very focus. So it has to be repeated many times. So this is level zero level in which we start, and after that the score will start. The person is asked. So in this case, the uh, additional factor. Sorry, it is not addition. This is additional factor. Here additional factors are not using any in the first case. In the second case, the number of targets are two, green, green. These are the targets, and five. These are number of destruction. So. For five seconds, it will be displayed, and after that, for ten seconds, it will be moving in a single color. And after that, you have to tell which were the targets. Okay, so that is repeated. And in the second case, four fixed hurdles are added. So here it is not visible. So there are four hurdles also in red color, which is not visible just now because this is an image and, and sound will also be problem. So in this case again. Uh, the process is repeated, and then the analysis is done. Uh, now, in this case, level two, the additional factors no, and the number of targets now three. Targets means if you see practically, what is target? Target is my team. In a football, my team member. Those are the targets. And destructor, other team, to play. And uh, additional factors. Means hurdles. Yes, because when we are playing, so the opposition party will try to create hurdles also. So, like then level four, level five, level six, level seven, level twelve, for example, here. So here the sound destructor as well as four hurdles. Four hurdles are placed as well as will add some sound also to for the destruction. But the person who is uh, acting, who is uh, looking on it. So he has to concentrate. If the concentration is disturbed, it means he is not focused. So then level 14, 15, that he has to clear. And after that, the analysis part will start. The methodology to handle the data, whatever we have picked up. So for that, we have to use the independent component analysis part, ICM. And uh, then we have the discrete wavelet transform for them. And the we will remove the noise and so on, and then uh, we will get data in D1 form. So this is one part. The second part, at this stage, we add the noise, and then again, that data is moved back, feedback, and then again we compare here, after D noise, and then compare here, where we have added the additional noise, whether, whether it is 100% removed or not removed, or it is compatible with the first uh, data which we have taken without noise, additional noise. So that is done. And after that, using the SVM classifier and that signal is used here. So these are the part one for so pre-processing, part two, second EG signal uh, quantity analysis, and then wavelet selection. Now the, for the EEG system, the emotive instrument, which is used, so this is from uh, 14 channel system is used in this study, and the electrode locations are placed here. So green color indicates that the electrode is properly placed, means it is not there is no loose contact. So whatever we are taking, it means signal is transmitting from the uh, subject to electrode and electrode to machine. So like this, this is real time data acquisition system which we have followed. So this is a emotive let us display. Now this kind of signal we will get. So out of that we have to concentrate on some signals. So now this is the EEG signal processing. So this is basically we are using EEG lab toolbar in MATLAB which is available. So uh, the artifacts in this case which will come are removed by the technique independent component analysis. So here I will show the one case. So in case of the independent component three, I have taken as an example here. So here you can see 
the one part corner is red. It means some noise, some problem is there. This is one part. Second, we will also see the continuous data, whether the data is coming or not coming. So in this case, we have seen the data is missing, but little bit data is coming. And the third approach, which is applied then, the activity power spectrum. So here we can see the data value is coming less than zero. It means we can reject. So we have 14 components which we are taking. So out of 14, we can reject one or two maximum, not more than that, because otherwise total data will be lost. So this I have shown one example only. So after that, the wavelet coefficient. So here, the original EEG signal, you will be getting the signal 0 to 64 hertz signal. And after that, this is divided in two parts, the approach and the uh, destruction part. So you will get this. This is rejected because this is frequency range is high. So we are coming low, low. Okay. And based on the frequency range, just I told you alpha, beta, gamma, theta. So according to that, we will take the, for example, here CA4, 0 to 4 hertz, we are getting signal. 4 to 8 hertz, we are getting signal here. 8 to 16 and 16 to 32 at the most. So uh, that signal is picked up. But and uh, on the other side, point. 0 to 0.5. This is rejected because at that level it will be just DC only. So these are the wavelets which we have studied. So out of which you can see the bio 3.1 that gives the good result. So total we have studied 109 wavelet number. So now let us see the community training effect. For that we have uh, made three groups of the subject. One is the player active group passive group. Active group is those who are player and the training is given. Second is passive group player, but training is not given. Third is control group, normal person. So here the participant selection. So group one, two, three, and then uh, pre psychological tests, which is done earlier with the help of MOD. And after that here, the Cognitive training is uh, cognitive training to active group is given and then post measurement, post measurement one and two. This is post measurement using a specific technique during that measurement is done for the EEG and this is after three months to ensure that how much effect is there for the study. So this procedure was followed here. And in this case, uh, the uh, this PEBL test battery was used. So under this, we have the number of tests. OC test, this one, continuous performance, and two test. So all these tests were performed, and out of which, just I will mention the OC test. So this test is just similar to the MOT test. This is from the standard battery. Because whatever we have designed, we have to compare with some standard also. So again, in this case, we have the target and destructor. So destructor is one or two, second, third. So, which is repeated twice and thrice. And after that, the analysis part will start. So, here this is the test time for pre test, post test, and post test two. So, total score. Suppose it is, I am taking zero uh, up to 100. So, initially for the pre test, the initial data here. So, these points show the average one. So, these are the bars for number of deviation basically. So now after giving the uh, training with the help of the payable battery, so you will see the difference is coming now with training because the person is more and more focused, concentrating more. But after three months when we have seen, for the passive group, you can see little decline as well as for the active group, uh, group little decline. So it should not happen. So it means more and more training is required. To make a person more and more effective. Yes, sir. Please, I will. So here, this is the data for average standard deviation. So this is for uh, theta. So in this case, you can see pre data. This is, this, uh, these are the values in micro So 2568 mean a standard deviation 726.73. So after the training, if you have seen the data is 2216. So it means this, these values are decreasing. Yeah. So it means what is expected in theta, it should decrease. It means more retention, more focus. Whereas in alpha, it should increase. 
I'm taking uh, telling wrong. Uh, it, uh, in this case, initially it is low. It should come. Uh, it is high. It should come low in case of alpha, because that is memory retention alpha. So, but here post post one and post two. So here you will again see there is some variation, and actually it is not expected. It should not happen, but it is happening. Because the after three months or four months, the person memory is less focused, which is expected by the training. So these are the conclusions. The cognitive training mo model is built to enhance the cognitive function. And uh, as just I told you, the variable 3.1 evaluated, evaluated as the optimal wavelength to extract the subfrequency band from the electroencephalogram. And the comparison of post mm -hmm. one and two showed that the effect of time is limited. It means uh, that focusing, that concentration is not for very long time. So this is all about the this talk. And for the further reading in detail, so all these things are available in these two papers. As well as I am always available. So thank you, much. Thank you, Professor. Special, special thanks for completing well in time. <laughs> so, I think the floor is open for one, one or two short questions. Very short mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. One or two very short mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. I do that. You might. Mm -hmm. So why do you keep calling it training? What is the training component? Training. Okay. Initially, we have used the MOT that is designed by these people, and after that, the PEB battery we have used. So this has become a training part. Before we start the game, we go. The the user is only getting used to it, but there is nothing like a training component. This is at the initial level for the when the person start playing and he is entering at national or international level. Uh, already the person is at very high international level. So what skill we can improve? He is already improved person. He is very, already very focused person. And another point is that you are you are only including the uh, movable direct vision, yes, not the right. peripheral vision. But in actual games, it, those components are concerned in the oh. peripheral vision. Like you, yeah, it's yeah. something which is not we are looking at directly, but on your side vision. So, yeah. But there you are only showing them a computer screen. And you are moving those joys in different direction and changing the person. So that's not the replica of the real. Uh, basically, initially, just I told you, target and distractor. Target is one team, distractor is another team. So when the football they are playing, so they are mixed up. So my party, my team, the target has to focus the target. I have to send ball to my person rather than to other. But the other team distracted, they will create problem. They will not allow ball to reach to a specific person. So it means we have to train in such a way so that they can focus only on the target. So that he can achieve the goal. So that was the purpose. I got to the point. My uh, thing was maybe you can add in, in the city that do not give the computer screen direct, directly in front of the user. It should be in the peripheral vision. That can be also done. But in this case, uh, I just not shown in detail. So in the uh, level 13, 14, 15, we have created number of levels also. One, two, three, four, eight, 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 little bit remember. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. So our next speaker is Dr. Shamlal Sharma, and he'll be online. So may I request our technical staff Please, he's on there. Yeah, yeah, he's there. So, so Dr. Shamla Sharma, please unmute yourself. Are you hearing me? Uh, initially, uh, start there, uh, uh, doctor, but uh, here, Mr. Only yes. start there. Uh, uh, starting the my presentation from there, uh, only basis of the surface metallurgy, and uh, initiate start the PPT.
my presentation is uh, show there my presentation is show there here sir hello anyone given the response here hello thank you hello hello my sound is clear yeah your sound is clear your presentation is well taken okay you can start you can start and please okay 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 uh, only uh, my presentation on the depend upon the, this topic on the time and in time surface metallurgy uh, so metallurgy for the precision digital manufacturing on the basis of digital manufacturing we can uh, measurement on the basis uh, surface uh, uh, on the behalf of uh, some of the instrument cmm and uh, informed uh, profile surface meter and uh, next some of the their uh, instrument are showing as a figure on the ppt uh, initial uh, we start the some uh, b uh, start on the basis of abstract the surface metallurgy is the important tool on the basis you, you can ensure that the, the tool is very perfect to measure the as accuracy on the surface uh, of the uh, uh, metal uh, any surface that uh, uh, depend upon uh, if the metal displays any surface on the surface plate like that then the surface is uh, uh, clearly plain uh, high precise uh, the high precision and measurement on depend upon the distal uh, digital uh, tooling that that digital tooling we can understand on the basis of uh, different instrument uh, that is uh, showing some of the uh, abstract here uh, only the concept and necessity and need full job of uh, of on time machine in time machine process surface metallurgy presented here and the modern uh, modern on the time machine in time process measurement system they are all over my is there uh this is the my uh, abstract the uh, some of the keys if they are uh, using in the measurement of the surface here uh, they inside the keywords like that and uh, they uh, depend upon some of the uh, in, uh, introduction initially start uh, uh, texture the surface text is there uh, their surface texture uh, check the uh, measurement on the basis of the phase uh, within the micro scale and sub micro scales features uh, uh, because uh, the precision we are very uh, accurate then you can uh, measure the accurate parameters on the surface of the metal uh, surface surface metallurgy is a measurement uh, of small scale features on the surface uh, and it is branch of the branch uh, metallurgy the, that is the metallurgy i can already understand that measurement of this uh, uh, any uh, object and in uh, in the history of that and the surface primary is form of surface uh, practicality and and surface finish uh, finish including surface uh, finish uh, because uh, um, some of the metals are rough there there because uh, i am making some composite and uh, the uh, initially composite is a uh, round uh, shape and uh, surface is rough and uh, that surface is uh, after that uh, the object uh, that after that the job is cutting different size uh, as per your specimen requirement the, on the basis of the uh, test and the parameter uh, the like that parameter are uh, showing that uh, surface roughness and other uh, and others uh, field resolution as depend upon the uh, uh, steel uh, casting uh, friction casting and uh, like that uh, other parameters uh, uh, characterization and uh, 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 fatigue uh, test uh, and uh, other tensile test the overall test uh, uh, using for after uh, making the specimen the uh, specify uh, as per your standards uh, standard base pe i uh, standard to base hai us base pe hum usko har ek specimen ko banate hain the parameter is correct on the basis of the standards on the different instrument test here the metallurgy uh, is a measurement is showing the on the basis of uh, introductions and some of the papers are uh, uh, focus 
there that uh, studies uh, because here the number of uh, papers uh, like that are as per a reference initially is start there uh, 7 to 11 the industry uh, they, these papers depend upon industry 4.4 and uh, other technology uh, fundamental challenges of modern factory automations and their uh, framework and uh, perspective. There are some of the methodology parameters like that uh, initially start there or uh, specifically optical co coordinate and surface texture methodology changes uh, significantly inside the uh, manufacturing few over the past, uh, last few years. There are some of the challenges. Yeah, some of the questions arise here that questions uh, focus on the changing on the basis of my study, uh, on the basis of my study uh, as uh, surface metallurgy. Uh, initially, uh, we start the concept uh, uh, 2004 and international, uh, international view of weight measurements expanded in the additional uh, definitions and meaning for the metallurgy concept to include nano metallurgy. And specifically, uh, VIPM define the metallurgy as a science of measurement and encompassing both experiment and theories of determinations of any level of uncertainty in any field of science. Uh, uh, there are some of the uh, uh, these uh, uh, concept here: uh, science metallurgy, applied metallurgy, and legal metallurgy. Uh, consumer industry, uh, consumer. Uh, a commercialization and uh, consumer uh, department of ministry is a legal metallurgy concern here that is uh, there uh, concern the regulate measurement standards and parameters like the ISO uh, different type of ISO certified product is there and that product uh, uh, to sale and purchase within a specified cost and particular uh, quantity uh, that is above is the applied metallurgy. Applied metallurgy is concerned with the man, uh, manufacturing process to uh, ensure appropriate of the measuring uh, measurement instrument. That measurement instrument is a calibrations there and uh, high uh, quality uh, quality control is there. And uh, scientific metallurgy, uh, they basically uh, depend upon the scientific concept there. That concept on the basis of uh, all sub, uh, field and concern, including uh, development of new uh, measurement method in uh, relation of uh, in relation of this thing, uh, uh, because uh, they standard uh, uh, transfer of the measurement uh, because uh, the different uh, using instrument the the different uh, measurement like that that user depend upon. Uh, different uh, I know uh, standard gauge. Standard gauge is specified will be using there that uh, uh, using for the uh, surface fine uh, measurement like that. The uh, fulfillment of the measurement concept of that inside scientifically uh, uh, because the, uh, this is the more effective uh, effective is there. And uh, another is the globally central uh, standardizing. Uh, precision uh, machining parts there uh, on the basis of CAD. I uh, I perform the number of uh, component uh, on the basis of CAD AutoCAD and AutoCAD is the 2D uh, two dimension and after that converting to the 3D. 3D is uh, uh, converting to the 3D and uh, after that uh, convey the message to the uh, 3D printer. Uh, 3D printer is making the component and uh, that component is performing with uh, high calibrations that uh, appropriate on the depend of the pa parameter on the CAD model. Uh, that CAD model is uh, uh, is is a perfectly measured and already is a uh, 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 architectural and uh, this the component uh, perfect uh, work is there. And uh, after calibrations, the uh, production machining are set and the quality ensure and uh, 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 and con quality control check for the resulting pipe. The resulting pipe because the component uh, uh, is making for, from the 3D printer, then uh, all the parameter is matching is finally. And after that, uh, the quality control ensure uh, all the quality instrument and uh, quality controls the effect in the resulting component. Uh, uh, quality ensure uh, insurance ensure the confidence the quality requirement will realize and uh, while the quality control check and the, the 
uh, that the requirement has been uh, have been accomplished is there and a precision measurement sensor in uh, manufacturing engineering uh, some of the uh, precision they are showing here blockage non contact sensors a sensor is the perfect uh, impact on the different uh, quality in instrument is there the parameter is changing on the basis of sensor they can uh, uh, i know uh, slip is uh, some of the defined uh, specimen and other sensors like that, uh, uh, electronic sensors, uh, which can sense and uh, transfer the measurement and uh, uh, changing any uh, things. And, and displacement uh, transducer, uh, transducer is the transfer, uh, this is the uh, displacement uh, performed there. And uh, uh, flexor levels and many probes using for that, uh, use inside that uh, under the uh, measurement sensor. And some of the challenges of precision measurement sensors. Uh, there are some of the uh, we have using some uh, uh, forces by, uh, applied by the probe to thing and fragile objects are too strong. They may damage the part. And if no uh, no contact probe are not option and uh, uh, tactile probes can be adjusted to alter touch and object like that. Uh, uh, cam soft wearing uh, can, uh, can also be inaccessible or uh, are too small for the sensor and probe. Uh, and possible solution is to use wireless sensor to collect the uh, required information and another uh, and a viable solution to use the uh, portable CMM, like the CMM coordinate, uh, coordinate measuring machine that only um, uh, check the measurement of the parameters on the component. Uh, the sensor uh, uh, touch, uh, the touch on the uh, CMM uh, check only the coordinate on the object only. And uh, uh, the type of uh, uh, metrology equipment uh, uh, initially, we start the only simple is there on the basis of uh, ISO 10,360. Uh, these these are the parameter of international standards like like that. Uh, uh, initially, simply we uh, understand only here cantilever uh, uh, that showing the previous years and uh, old years like that. Uh, yeah. Please, yeah. Hello. 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 Okay. Okay. Do, uh, little bit the sound is lower. Is there? Uh, again, uh, given the instruction about it, so some of the sound like that. Uh, you listen here. Uh, my sound is slow. Uh, listen here. Yeah. Hello. Hear you, but your time is up now. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, uh, next, some of the instruments are showing their uh, measurement uh, for the CMM, uh, like that CMM uh, here. And uh, uh, after that, uh, my, um, my collection in parameter that is the on the basis of scientific instrument is there and uh, scanning lasers is it there that depend upon the uh, laser sources are uh, rotating mirror is it collecting and after that processing show here only uh, some of the parameters are depend upon the digital uh, one year digital screw gazes there and reliability for the automatic manufacturing uh, already uh, uh, know that the any digital instrument are used is perfectly on the basis of uh, uh, requirement of uh, on the testing uh, uh, equipment like that that component testing on the basis of requirement uh, required instrument like that uh, only as uh, some of uh, my conclusions or overall study on the basis of the different type of digital instrument that instrument are using uh, which component are using inside that and uh, how can measure it and uh, uh, how can process inside that uh, every uh, component of uh, 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 component and uh, uh, object which can be used to perform as a testing is there. Sir, sir any questions or inquiries there? Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay. And maybe if there are any questions, it will come on the chat. Okay. 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 Thank you for your good presentation and inclusive manner. Thank you. Can I ask one question? Sir, uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you asked the question. Are you able to hear a person? He is asking one can question. You, can you please hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, clearly. Yeah, you can. What kind of the parameters you are making the measurement using CMM? I don't think that you and can. CMM is a coordinate measuring machine. I have already a uh, sale that machine because that, uh, uh, we have uh, any component you take there. And uh, I, uh, no, no, no. yeah, uh, the question is whether you can yeah. measure the surface structure using CMM. No, 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 no. Only, only nodal fixed um, depend upon the uh, only surface or on the perfect model only, not a reference surface. And this ISO one zero three six zero. This is yeah. for the calibration of the CMM, not for the calibration using CMM. Uh, CMM only depend upon the uh, reverse process only. Uh, any component of uh, making already uh, uh, that component uh, uh, you can uh, make. Uh, Perfectly, uh, repetitively. Not a rough surface you can use. Okay. That is a sensor uh, is not touched there. No? The sensor is not a perfect on the performing the surface. Okay. Uh, sir, who is asking question is expert in the yeah. So I think you understood your point. मैंने बोलने के बदले ऐसे आप मैं बोल रहा हूँ कि सरफेस जो प्लेन होता है प्लेन सरफेस पे ही हम इसको यूज कर सकते हैं रफ में नहीं कर सकते हैं रफ में करेंगे तो दिक्कत आ जाएगा ना तो सेंसर टच हो के वो परफॉर्म नहीं कर पाएगा कोऑर्डिनेट को मेजर नहीं कर पाएगा वो सही तरीके से Okay. Uh, now, our next speaker. sir, uh, sir, uh, sir, uh, uh, my name is Mr. Shyamla, Shyamla Sharma, but here you can see there um, Dr. Shyamla Sharma. Please correct there. Okay, okay. 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 thank you. Sir. So, our next speaker is Dr. S. Johnson. He's from IUCA Pune. So since we are running short of time, so I personally request you to please adhere with the timings. After 10 minutes, we'll give a bell and try to complete. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Stanley Johnson. Uh, I work at the Precision and Quantum Measurement Lab at the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. And uh, today I'll be talking about the efforts uh, that we are taking in the lab to uh, indigenize. Uh, of feedback control uh, system, which is used for laser frequency stabilization. So just to give you a few, uh, just a few words about our lab. So uh, we are uh, the precision and quantum measurement lab. So our goals are quantum metrology. Uh, in short, uh, the main goal here is to build an optical clock. And once we do that, uh, we want to use it uh, make various investigations in fundamental science. And uh, it will also have uh, applications in technology and applied science. So, uh, the group is led by Professor Shubhadeep Day, and we have a few uh, postdocs uh, 
and students uh, working in the lab. So, uh, as I just mentioned, the main goal of our lab right now is to build an optical clock. So, uh, in simple words, an optical clock is nothing but a laser with a very high frequency stability. And uh, this is a top level schematic of uh, of an optical clock, a highly simplified version. So it has three uh, major components. So this section on the left is what we call a cavity stabilized laser. So we start with a commercially available laser, which has uh, not that uh, high of a frequency stability. And then we use uh, a uh, what we call an ultra stable fabricator cavity. I'll talk about it in the next slides. And we use uh, this as a frequency reference. So we reference this laser to this cavity and we stabilize its frequency to a certain level. So this is one aspect. And then we send the light to uh, the second portion, which is, you could say, is the heart of the optical clock. Uh, so we're using a uh, trapped ytterbium ion. So it has a very well defined uh, clock, uh, it has a very well defined transition frequency. Uh, uh, at 467 nanometers. So we use that as our absolute frequency reference. And so all this put together will give you a uh, light which is extremely stable in frequency. And once you do that, you would want to send it, say, to another part of the lab or to another lab altogether. Uh, and to do that, we need uh, what we call a uh, uh, phase stabilized optical fiber. And I'll be talking about that as well. So uh, in the lab, uh, we have completed the design and simulation of uh, this ultra-stable. This is a photograph of a ultra-stable cavity. It's a fabric pyro cavity. And uh, we've, uh, we are actually now looking to uh, uh, manufacture it. And uh, so that's the ultra-stable cavity. And here for the uh, final trap, also there are several uh, components that are already uh, being manufactured and we are looking to complete the setup there. And uh, we, for the uh, fiber phase stabilization right now, uh, we have uh, spools of optical fiber, which uh, we will very soon start our experiments with. And to uh, control all these systems, so in each of these systems, uh, there are several feedback loops that are running. So what we have done here is uh, we have developed a, uh, what we call a lockbox, essentially it's a, it's a digital server, so I'll be talking about this uh, primarily in the rest of the talk. So, uh, as I was mentioning, so this part is the uh, the cavity stabilized laser, and uh, this is a uh, drawing of the interstable cavity. You can see here it is uh, shielded in three layers of uh, metal uh, encasing uh, for temperature stability. We also uh, take care to uh, damp it from vibrations. Uh, but even though we do all this, uh, there is still microscopic mo uh, motion of the mirrors that make up uh, the ultra stable cavity. So, because we're using it as a frequency reference, uh, that uh, also shifts the frequency. To give an example, a length change in, in the order of 10 to the minus 16 meters is sufficient to shift the frequency uh, about tens of millihertz. So, th that's a problem. So, uh, and we very carefully uh, try to uh, analyze and uh, account for all these noise terms. So the main noise terms, duration, as I just mentioned, temperature fluctuation. So we uh, keep this in a uh, temperature stabilized enclosure. And uh, also the uh, the Brownian noise of the mirror coatings themselves, uh, then it eventually becomes a limiting factor. So um, the uh, the primary method that is used to lock the laser to an ultra-stable cavity is called uh, the pound revolve technique. It is, uh, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very uh, well used, well understood technique. So just to give you an idea of what happens in this technique is uh, we start with a, a laser and um, what we do, and the laser has uh, a central peak. And we pass that light through an electro optic modulator, which uh, inputs to uh, frequency sidebands. So the x axis here is frequency. So inputs to frequency sidebands on, on the carrier or on the uh, light coming from the laser. And uh, we set it up in such a manner that we can uh, send light into the cavity and also read off the light reflected back. So 
And uh, let's say the blue, uh, blue uh, peak here is the, uh, the resonance, one of the resonance frequencies of the ultra So uh, what happens is when you make, when you set up the system in this manner, uh, the uh, there is a beat node that is generated between the uh, central wavelength and the two side bands, and uh, the amplitude and phase of this beat node uh, conveys complete information about uh, where exactly uh, your instantaneous laser frequency is with respect to your reference. So this reference will not change, but the laser frequency will keep jumping up and down. So that information is is conveyed in the amplitude and phase of the beat node. So the beat node. Uh, uh, it, it is measured by a servo, and then, uh, then uh, based on that, you actuate the laser to uh, bring this uh, laser frequency and keep it as close as you can to the reference. So this is a continuously running process, and uh, this is what we have developed in the lab. So uh, all that you see here as a schematic is actually implemented on an FPGA. And uh, so that is our digital lock in servo. And currently, we don't have a, a laser uh, or the boundary of a horse uh, system set up in the lab. So instead, we uh, use another pair of lasers to emulate the entire uh, optical part of the system. So with this emulator, we can test this servo in a closed loop and get its, uh, its, uh, its uh, closed loop uh, parameters. So there are several uh, uh, points that we have tried to take care of so that we uh, minimize the uh, minimize the uh, noise in the system. For example, uh, if there are any timing violations in the FPGA HDL uh, code, we take care to add pipelining to, uh, to get rid of those timing violations. Another important point is that this entire FPGA setup is referenced to a rubidium clock. So a 10 megahertz uh, highly stable RF frequency coming from the rubidium clock is uh, used as a reference, and this entire setup is controlled by a graphical user interface. And uh, as I was saying, uh, just to give you a comparison, so this left plot here is when there is uh, when you generate the clocks on the or on your FPGA with the internal oscillator. So there's a very high standard deviation, and once you lock it to your uh, External reference, uh, it's uh, the standard deviation is uh, very low. And this is important for the, for, for the FPGAs because they have to generate very stable frequencies and also when communicating from one FPGA to another, the clock synchronization is important. So this is a picture of the lock box and the emulator in the background. Uh, an example of the graphical user interface and uh, we try to um, use a, a low cost setup in comparison to another uh, to other applications. Uh, this is, you could say, an important result here. So the blue one is with no stabilization. So y-axis here is frequency noise, so a lower number is better. The blue is without stabilization, and when you turn on one PID in the red and two in the yellow, so uh, we get lower noise and the purple here is a commercially available laser. So we can say that we are at or uh, slightly below that commercially available laser, which is a, a one hertz laser. So that is encouraging. Uh, I'll quickly go through uh, the second application of the servo, which is for fiber phase stabilization. So uh, due to a random temperature changes, the length of the fiber changes randomly and it changes the phase of the light passing through. So uh, in general, it is, uh, although the simple calculation gives, gives 10 meters, the generally uh, rule of thumb is anything about three meters, you should fiber phase stabilize. So uh, this is a setup that we use, uh, that we plan to use, and this is a very conventional setup. If you send light from your local end to the remote end, you retro reflect it, and you beat it locally, and therefore the beat note conveys uh, complete information of the uh, frequency shifts at the, uh, the fiber encounters, and then you can measure it and then compensate for it. And we use uh, this FPGA, the same FPGA that we used for the other servo, we use it here. And uh, this is the internal schematic, essentially a lock in amplifier. And we have tested it currently only in the open loop. We don't have the full setup ready. And uh, the, 
message here is that the mobile load bandwidth is more than sufficient to meet the noise requirement, the noise requirement bandwidth. And uh, this is where we use it. Uh, an example here within the lab, short range, a long range application. Uh, in future, perhaps we may uh, connect to another lab in, in, in Pune, which is also planning to develop its own optical block. So it can send light from one to another. So we have uh, that as well. And uh, to conclude, uh, we have indigenized uh, these uh, FPGA based servos for laser frequency stabilization and cyber phase stabilization. And with the emulator, we have shown that uh, they can work at the first line with level. And we are trying to further reduce the noise using uh, linear power supplies and uh, low noise. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. So interesting talk, I think we are just keeping the trend. Uh, the floor is open for very short one or two questions. Uh, once, uh, you, you, what kind of uh, uh, photodiodes do you use to detect the heat signal from the UM? That is the one question. The second question, uh, very briefly, you can explain. Are you able to? Uh, uh, are you able to uh, monitor the temperature changes? And resulting phase changes in the optical fiber. Oops. Okay, so to answer your first question, photodiodes, uh, we uh, plan to use 20 gigahertz PID uh, thor labs photodiodes uh, for uh, <coughs> detecting the beam. And to answer your second question, uh, well, the fiber, if, if it's a fiber within the lab, we can do it. But uh, if it's a deployed fiber, uh, then it will be more difficult. So uh, we, uh, for the deployed deploy problem, we don't really plan to do that. But we can definitely test it within the lab. No, no, not yet, not yet. Yeah. I have one question, very sure. short question. Sure. Uh, you, you spoke about temperature stability. Yes. Yeah. And that's a very important concept. Can you give me your figures, how much stability your system is and what sensor Nice time and call time mm -hmm. to keep that stable. Uh, for mm -hmm. normal stability? Yeah. Well, uh, we are targeting plus minus five million Kelvin. That's the target. So we haven't built the system yet. We, we are only we are really taking these numbers and putting them down. Mm -hmm. Actually, I can show you. I can, yeah. For example, here uh, we have this uh, yellow curve. So uh, we have uh, tried to uh, calculate various noise terms and temperature. Is all, uh, essentially is a, is a dominant uh, is one of the dominant terms here. So this one uh, I believe was taken with plus minus 10 millikelvin. But uh, since then we have learned that there are some other groups that have actually gone sub kelvin, sub millikelvin. So uh, right now our, uh, we have then shifted to plus minus five millikelvin. But even that is an overestimate. So right now we haven't built anything. That's what I can say. But uh, we are looking to uh, add these. Yeah, yeah. Yes, optical Yes, optical Yes, uh, Well, we, we will start with the, we have a laser that's not that stable. So we'll just uh, exercise all the ex components in the system. Because, because I'm asking. Because yes. And since your uh, block laser is not ready yet, correct. So for testing that, you need a stable source because then you are not sure whether the laser is changing or the phase changing is correct. Not happening because of the fire. Correct, correct. Yes. So the laser that we will use currently, we won't be able to go any lower than that. Yes. With the testing. That's, that's so only true. only when the CLD cavity based laser will be ready, then you can. Correct. Correct. That's only when we can get the full performance. Thank yes. you, Stan. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So now we continue further. Uh, may I invite Mr. P. N. Hindi Krishnan from FCRI? Yeah, please are there with the time. On the hands. He's online. Oh, good. So maybe I have to look it again. Please unmute yourself, Mr. Hindi Krishnan. Yeah, 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 sir. Yeah, okay. So since, sir, you are short, since you are running short of time, may I personally request you to please adhere to the time? Ten minutes. Oh, are, 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 are you able to see the slides? Yeah, yeah, we are able to see the slides. Yes, sir. Okay, I'm in uh, in uh, FCR Fluid Control Research Institute as a research engineer. 
So my paper is on actually uh, critical flow Venturi nozzle calibration and validation with ISO standards. This is abstract, so I will go uh, in detail. So why this uh, need for this test? So we have uh, critical flow Venturi nozzles which are widely used for different flow meter, gas flow meter calibration applications. So these nozzles we are used at different operating pressures and Reynolds number range normally. So it is op we are using it for a one particular nozzle in itself. We are using at different operating pressures or Reynolds number range. So our experiment aims at studying the influence of Reynolds number on coefficient of discharge of the nozzle over a wide range of operating pressure and validation of the same with the experimental series with the ISO equation. So there is an equation provided in the ISO 9300 uh, standard. So we are, whatever that values obtained using the experimental method of, of the uh, of coefficient of discharge is compared with the values given in the uh, ISO standards for, as a validation. So this is the geometry of the nozzle. Uh, so we have this is designed as per ISO 9300. So we can see the throat diameter D and we have a pressure tapping at 1D location and temperature tapping on 2D location and the uh, upstream straight length requirement is uh, 6.5D, more than 6.5D, anything is sufficient. There is a flow straightener and uh, downstream side there is no other conditions. And there are some surface reference recommendations also as per ISO 9300. So this is the uh, surface reference recommendations. And for uh, mass flow determination, uh, this is of the nozzle. This is the equation. Uh, mass flow rate is area into this coefficient of discharge into critical flow factor C star. P is upstream pressure and molecular weight, gas constant and temperature. So this is the equation used for calculation of, calculation of the mass flow rate. So the, coming to the test methodology, uh, we have uh, different nozzles of capacities ranging from 6.3 meter cube per hour to 45. So we have selected four nozzles, 6.3, 12, 25 and 45 meter cube per hour. So which is calibrated using different facilities of FCRA and which are uh, to get the different Reynolds number by varying the operating pressure and the CD was established. And uh, this nozzle is calibrated using uh, uh, our own PVTT facility, well prover system, both in suction and pressure mode, which are simulating the low Reynolds number condition that is at near atmosphere and near ambient condition. And for high pressure uh, using a uh, primary standard PSGS, primary standard gravimetric system, so which is calibrated from the pressure up to 2 to 20 bar absolute, which, which will simulate the higher Reynolds number. Range. So all these nozzles are calibrated on these ranges for at various pressure conditions. So this is a spe specification of the PVTT facility. It's a pressure oleum temperature time facility. So we have a two meter cube uh, uh, oleum vessel and pressure and temperature we have, uh, pressure is near ambient and temperature is, uh, we are maintaining 25 plus minus one degree. And maximum flow rate that we can calibrate using the facility is 90 meter cube per hour with an uncertainty of 0.1 percentage. So this will simulate the low Reynolds number calibration of the uh, Venturi nozzle. So this is the facility. So we have a vessel and a vacuum source. The nozzle will be uh, assembled to the upstream side of the vessel. So there are pressure temperature measurement all over the uh, vessel. Uh, so mass flow rate will be established using this facility using the oleum and uh, density condition. And that mass flow rate will be used for estimation of the coefficient of discharge. So CD will be established using this facility for the nozzle. Uh, this will be uh, uh, normally for low Reynolds number because uh, it is operating at near atmospheric pressure condition because nozzle inlet side will be open to atmosphere. And for the higher pressure, we use the primary standard uh, gravimetric system, so which is up to 50 meter cube per hour and up to 20 bar we can use this. And the vessel volume is 1.5 meter cube and with an uncertainty of 0.1 percentage. So since the mass flow rate, we can go up to 1000 kg per hour. And which this will be used for uh, high Reynolds number calibration of the nozzles, maybe 2 to 20 bar pressure rates. 
So this is a schematic of the setup. So we have a mass comparator and a vessel, and we have a interconnected air reservoirs of different uh, 11 meter cube. We have four vessels. So from that uh, air will be distributed this, to this uh, grammatic system, and it will be passed through the critical flow nozzles. So it will be maintained a critical condition over the uh, calibration, and uh, say in this case also we will be estimating the CD values of the. And we have a bell prover system also. So this method we have actually uh, used for the uh, pressure mode. That is uh, uh, pre using the pressure mode of this uh, proving system. We have calibrated at uh, uh, in between pressure range uh, near to 1.5 bar absolute uh, pressure. So we have this up to 40 meter cube per hour flow range in this facility and with an uncertainty of 0.12 percentage. And this is the ISO equation for the CD, which is mentioned in the standard. Uh, so we have different. Uh, this is with respect to CD and Reynolds number. So we have the coefficients given in the standard, and this is applicable for the throat Reynolds number range of 2.1 e 10 to the power 4 to 3.2 e 10 to the power 7. So this is the coefficient that is which is given in the ISO equation standard. So this is summary of results uh, for the 6.3 meter cube per hour nozzle. Uh, we have calibrated from 1 to uh, 20 bar absolute pressure using two facilities PVTT and PSGS. So this uh, experimental values and also the equation uh, based on the equation ISO equation values are given. So you can see the deviations on that side. So this is the plot against the Reynolds number versus CD. So we can see the actual uh, values, experimental values and also the ISO values. Coming to the 12.5 CFEM, the same uh, method we are adopted using the primary standard facility, gravimetric system. And uh, also for 25 meter cube per hour nozzle, we have used three facilities, PVTT, Bell Prover and PSGS. So we, we are done from one to 16 bar absolute. So you can see a more closer values in the 25 meter cube per hour with respect to the uh, standard values. Uh, experimental values are nearly matching in this case. So you can see the plot. And coming to the 45, we have done only for the PVTT facility uh, uh, because of uh, some time constraints. We are not able to do using the other facilities. So this one only done using the near atmospheric condition only. But uh, values are very closer with ISO values. So our observations are uh, generally an increasing trend in CD values are obtained with uh, Reynolds number. So the same trend is reported in ISO 9300 equation also. So a variation of one percentage is reported in ISO uh, with for a vary pressure ranges from one to twenty bar absolute. So a maximum variation of 0.9 percentage is observed by the experimental method. So it is nearly same one percentage and 0.9 percentage. So by the experimental method also we are getting the uh, nearly same uh, variation. And uh, a deviation up to 0.8 percentage is observed for lower operating pressures from ISO values. Uh, but at higher Reynolds number, uh, we have experimental values as, uh, more closer to the ISO values. So there, there can be an uncertainty compound of order 0.3 to 0.4 in the CD values due to the variation from pressure 2 to 20 bar absolute. And we have to account for that uncertainty, uh, same in the uncertainty estimates. So experimentally, it is proved that uh, CD values are dependent on the throat Reynolds number. But for it is observed that for the higher Reynolds number, uh, the which is are closer, ISO values and experimental values are closer. The possible causes of CD variation from ISO values may be due to the machining inaccuracies, surface surface variations, or straight length requirements or disturbances in flow. So this can be the conditions. So with an increase in the Reynolds number, uh, CD values are more closer to ISO values. Uh, this may be due to the fact that influence of roughness, surface roughness is negligible at higher Reynolds numbers. But uh, for that, we have required more studies are required in this to know the influence of surface roughness on that uh, actually the CD values. So we have to give more studies on uh, surface surface uh, variations effect on the uh, CD values. So our con uh, it is to conclude that instead of assuming constant values for CD for the uh, operating pressure from different operating pressures, we have to use uh, different uh, values, different CD values which are uh, at different Reynolds number range. So we may have to plot that values based on the Reynolds number and CD values and for for a precision flow calibration application. 
the references. Thank you, sir. Uh, we thank Udni for the nice presentation. Uh, floor is open for questions. If there are no more questions, I think uh, we thank Udni once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the yeah. next presentation is by Dr. Vicha Gupta. Uh, uh, she is from A very good afternoon to everybody. I am Dr. Richard Gupta from Maharaja Sulaiman Institute of Technology. I am going to give the presentation topic Failure Mode and Effect Analysis of PCB for Quality Control Process with Uncertainty. Basically, uh, what I have done for my analysis, uh, the study is done in an electronic manufacturing industry in which the PCB manufacturing process is done right from the raw material assembly process and then uh, through surface mount uh, machines and then finally the PCB fabrication, the complete PCB fabrication process is done. What basically uh, we have done, what we have analyzed in the industry, we have implemented FMEA, that is a failure mode and effect analysis technique to optimize the PCB design process in the industry. PCB is, is, is a very important uh, part of any electronic project. Uh, so uh, it has to be accurate in all the aspects. Any kind of deficiency cannot be tolerated by in, in PCB. So what basically we have done by applying this FMEA, we have, uh, uh, we have identified what could be the possible modes of failure, how that uh, failure, what effect this failure can have and how that failure can be avoided. Another tool that we have made use for this FMA analysis is RPN, that is risk priority number. Uh, what we have done, we have uh, we have divided the risk, we have given different priorities to the risk, and which risk is having the higher priority, we have given it more uh, dedication to. To analyze this risk priority number, another we have considered three factors like severity, detection, and occurrence. Severity, according to the standard, uh, a, a score is uh, a score is given to a severity factor. A score of one to ten, we have divided the severity score from one to ten depending upon its severity. Like we have given a score of one if uh, if that defect does not cause a much uh, loss, a two if that defect uh, a very few customers can detect that defect and it does not cause any uh, hindrance to the performance. And uh, likewise, uh, a, a, a score has been given to every severity. Like the score of nine is a uh, score of eight is given if uh, if it is causing a major defect, and a score of eight is given. So uh, likewise, we, uh, what we have given, what we have done, we have uh, identified different severities, and accordingly, we have given a severity number to that uh, process. Similarly, occurrence, we have given a score. To a occurrence given on in that standard. If suppose a failure that uh, failure rate, rate is less than one in ten thousand. Suppose there is a uh, occurrence of defect in a PCB is one out of ten thousand. Then we have given a occurrence criteria of one. Uh, similarly, a, a, a score of one to ten is given depending upon it for failure rate. Like if a failure rate is one in five, then the occurrence is very high. It's a very severe occurrence. So uh, a score of nine is given to it. 
So these are basically uh, the various, we have identified various operations of PCB design in the electronics manufacturing industry, like uh, uh, issue of raw material, forming of component, placement of SLK components, automatic insertion, date soldering, lead cutting, touch up, visual inspection, and then finally the PCB formation. These are some of the pictures that we have taken from the industry. Uh, like uh, they have, they made use of the complete uh, storage, uh, a well-defined storage pattern to store the PCB components. Everything has to be labeled like we have seen in, uh, in a medical store. Everything is being labeled. Similarly, all the electronic components has to be well-defined, well-labeled. Uh, they have to be, uh, they have to be given for the protection according to their uh, date of expiry also. That has to be considered first in, first out. That process has to be considered. So every storage has to be done in a very proper and manner. Uh, as, as we discussed, the, the PCB fabrication is done in SMT machine. So this is the view of the SMT machine. Automatic insertion of various components are done. The components are, uh, the all the components, SMT components, the PCB is well defined by the software and the, uh, all the SMT components are automatically inserted. Uh, these are the various, uh, uh, like uh, what uh, this, uh, this is just uh, what we have done. We have defined various steps. Then what could be, what should, uh, what should be our requirement and what could be the possible phase of mode that we have identified. Like uh, if we talk uh, starting from like if we talk about the storage of the incoming material, what we require is that the component should be placed at their designated places and all the components should be kept in their well-defined temperature range. What could be the potential failure mode that they, there may be some mixing of the components or the components are da damaged during storage or uh, the storage beyond shell line. The components are not used. They are kept in the uh, shell only. They got uh, a storage temperature and RH within a specified limit. So all these parameters has to be keep in consideration to minimize the uh, loss and to increase the efficiency of any industry. Like uh, there's one factor that is lot rejection ratio. So by following this, all these FMA points, the lot rejection ratio of the uh, industry can be improved. The efficiency of the industry can be improved. Its turnover can be improved. The customer uh, satisfaction rate can be improved. The other points are also uh, analyzed and an FMA study has been given to other points also, like placement of SMD components. Uh, the 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 points that has to be considered like solder paste printing component mounting the, because if there is insufficient solder print then the components will not be mounted properly and uh, the PCB will not work properly and it will it will give uh, lower results then on the basis of their uh, potential failure mode uh, we give a severity occurrence and detection number to them and RPN is calculated. Similarly, there are other components, uh, there are other processes like automatic insertion, touch up, cleaning of PCB. Uh, we have identified what could be the possible failure mode. Then uh, we have given a RPA number. On the basis of that, a correction can be implied. So uh, finally, what, what we conclude by study, by implementing this FMA technique, like uh, uh, the lot rejection ratio of the company has been improved from 500 ppm to 900 ppm. That is, uh, what does that mean? Earlier there was 500, uh, 5500, 5500 uh, defects in 1 million and then by applying this FMA technique, the defects has been decreased to 900 uh, parts in 1 million. So that is the uh, usage of implementing this FMA technique and the uh, RPN technique in PCB manufacturing industry. Thank you. Yeah, I have one question here. Yeah, I, yeah, no, no, I have one question. You are talking of 5500 ppm to 900 ppm. Which particular model you have adopted to obtain this data? Uh, sir, this is the uh, this is the final PCB fabrication data. Once the final uh, PCB, the whole process is being done. After that, uh, this has been completed. I mentioned these are the failures. 
ultimately you have to analyze it to come to this figure. So some model has to be inserted or used where all these data, whatever rejection you are uh, highlighting, those has to be incorporated in that. Then only you can come up with the data. Otherwise, how you will get the, if there is a manual calculation or what, what type of calculation? So it's a manual calculation that has been done. Uh, supplementary to that question. So is this process implemented in India anywhere in the quality system which you have, uh, you know? Yes, sir. So it's a part of the quality system. So it is already implemented in all the uh, uh, all the manufacturing hubs in India. Sir, yes, sir. All the manufacturing. Uh, is all the, also the QR code or any digitalization is possible when we are doing this uh, storage? Yes, sir. We are uh, QR code is given to identify the uh, date of uh, storage also. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last presentation today will be by Mr. Ashish Ranjan, Fair Labs. Uh, I think I request uh, Ashish Ranjan for uh, 10 minutes of time. So we are already uh, in the lunch time. So kindly stick to the uh, 10 minutes. Please. Mike, <laughs> 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 पहले बारे सारे बंद कर दो भाई इतनी विंडो खुल रही है कितना खोल रखा है अभी लंच के पहले सारा बंद कर देंगे बड़ा कंफ्यूजन है वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू वन एंड ऑल प्रेजेंट हियर माइसेल्फ अशोक रंजन but before we begin with our presentation, I would like to thank Admit for giving us this wonderful opportunity. And to all the dignitaries and delegates present here for their time. I'll quickly take you through what we want to talk about in this presentation. We'll first talk about who we are and the background of Fair Labs. We'll then move on to the accreditation, the recognitions and certifications that qualify Fair Labs. Moving on to the testing and calibration facilities. And then a brief glimpse of the client list that we work with. So we were established in the year 1999 and it has been a good 22 plus years of run. Uh, in 2006, we received our first NABL accreditation for chemical testing. Three years later, we received our NABL accreditation for biological testing as well. In 2012, we were identified and authorized for the Ministry of Environment and Forestation and Climate Change, Government of India. In just two years after that, we set up an ultra modern facility with one of the largest in ABL parameter scopes that any privately held laboratory has ever had. In 2016, we set up a calibration facility and also established radiology testing services. In 2017, we received our calibration accreditation from NABL. And at present day, we started off with one facility. We now stand at three different units, specifically for testing and calibration in Gurgaon itself. I would like to highlight the mission, vision, and values of Fair Labs. Our mission is to become a source of national pride by contributing to the world of scientific and industrial development in the diverse areas of chemical, biotechnological, electrical, thermal, and environmental technology. Our vision is to assess the needs of scientific and industrial community on a continuous basis and to identify the focus areas for research and development. We at Fair Labs want to generate technology that improves the process related knowledge for the benefit of industry, environment and public at large. We regularly act as a bridge between the academic and industrial community 
and we facilitate a meaningful and mutually beneficial interaction between the same. As for every organization, we also stand by our values of integrity, accountability, and client confidentiality, attention to issues of both domestic and global relevance, appreciation of intellectual excellence and creativity in every aspect, and an unfettered spirit of exploration, rationality, and enterprise. Talking about the accreditation, certification, and recognition, we have been accredited by the National Accreditation Board for Testing and Calibration Laboratory, that is NAPL, AERB, APEDA, T-Board of India, and IOPEPC. We are recognized by the Bureau of Indian Standards, DSIR, and MOEFNCC. We have certain certifications which includes ISO 45001, ISO 9001, ISO 27001, ISO 14001, and ISO 22000. We are authorized by the Ministry of Ayush, Food Safety and Standards Authority of India and by AIC. Apart from that, Fair Labs has been awarded the status of National Reference Laboratory by the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India in the year 2019. We are proud to say that we are the only privately held organization to, hold, to get this prestigious position in the oils and fats category. This is the slide which represents the uh, MOU signed for reference material production at NPL. Talking about the infrastructure at Fair Labs, we are into four different divisions. Firstly, testing. We provide chemical, biological, biotechnological, radiological, mechanical, thermal, and electrical testing facilities. Our calibration division is set up into four different segments. First being the thermal metrology, second, mechanical metrology, third, electrotechnical metrology, and fourth, fluid flow metrology. In terms of proficiency testing, we provide proficiency, proficiency testing services in both testing and calibration. In terms of reference material production, we provide reference material for chemical, biological, and radiological segments. Our two certifications, that is the inspection body according to ISO 17020 and product certification body ISO 17651 are still in pipeline and we'll soon be happy to have them. Regarding the categories in which we provide our testing facilities, our categories are not isolated. We provide facilities in following 24 categories. Moving ahead, please let me, uh, please allow me to highlight the major equipments that we have at Fair Labs. We have GCMSMS and dioxin analyzer for dioxin analysis, GCMSMS HS Fogen trap, GCs with ECD, NPD, TCD, and FID detectors, LCMSMS, LCEA, EA, IRMS for honey testing, pulse NMR, which is used for solid fat content analysis, IC, uh, LCICP, MS, ICPOES. We have UV visible double beam spectrophotometer which is a very versatile instrument for antioxidants and color analysis. Falling number, which is used to check for starch damage, and it is uh, very uh, frequently used in the bakery industry, where starch damage content has to be less. Proximate analyzers, refractometers, DSC, which is differential scanning calorimetry, for finding out the melting point and different thermal stability for food ingredients. We have FTIRs, polarimeters, Rancimet, which is used for indication of oil health, RT-PCRs and QPCRs, which are used for DNA-based studies. In India, GMO products are, are prohibited, and hence RT-PCRs and PCRs are used to check for GMO presence. El ELISA <coughs> and microplate uh, readers, color analyzers, iron chromatograph, water activities, alkalizers, which are used to check the alcoholic content in beverages, TOC analyzers, Carl Fisher Moisture Analyzer to analyze the moisture content of those products in which the uh, presence of moisture is very less. Viscometers, bomb calorimeters, valgon particle size analyzer to understand the size of the particle is under uh, uh, permissible limit or not. And also we have oxygen transmission rate and vapor, uh, water vapor transmission rate instruments. Our laboratory is equipped with more than 1,000 instruments, and all are these from leading, in, leading instrument suppliers like Atago and Simatsu Japan, Wechler Toledo USA, Agilent USA, and Metrohem Switzerland. These are the categories and parameters that we uh, test for. We have more than 16,000 list, uh, uh, list listed in our NABL scope, which is one of the largest in Asia. And these are the testing parameters that we work on. The categories and the parameters are highlighted here. 
for characteristic identity we test for parameters like ph alcoholic acidity moisture and total solids and many more for purity and adulterants we look for mineral oil castor cotton seed oil for, for, for quality we look for miv ffa peroxide values for nutritional components we look for trans fat cholesterol vitamins and minerals for additives and fortifications we look for vitamin a vitamin d2 and d3 vitamin e for environmental effects uh, and along with, with that for microbiological status degree of damage retention and shelf life behavior these parameters have been listed here similarly we have our categories into radioactive contaminants health markers halal migrants from uh, packaging materials active compounds and for compressed gases in terms of calibration facilities all our major equipment which is more than 200 instruments are from leading instrument suppliers like fluke isotech zera luma sense technologies indicon metlo toledo sartorius yokogawa and mitsu toyo japan and narsonic a few of which you will see in the exhibition in front Uh, we have a fixed point meter measures for uh, zinc, aluminium, gallium, and triple point of water. We have humidity and temperature generators. We have IR source generators, GPS based rubidium frequency standards, which are rare to find in India. We have high precision precision CTPT under electrotechnical calibration. We also uh, do calibration in um, mm. pressure tachometers, gas flow calibrators, AC <laughs> standards, and DC refractory standards. <laughs> Here are some of the categories and parameters. Out of which, I would like to highlight our unique calibration facilities in thermal sensors, which ranges from minus 180 degrees to minus 80 degrees, which is one of the best CMCs. We also have calibration of PRT and RTD at the liquid nitrogen point, which is minus 190 degrees Celsius. We uh, have calibration specifically for IR thermometers, imagers, and pyrometers, with again one of the best CMCs in the country for a privately held lab, and. In line with these, we have more than 400 parameters listed in our NBL scope, which is again one of the largest in India. These are some of our representative clients, and we have also worked on R&D and NPD projects along with Cargill, uh, Alana, Devyani Foods, and also they have worked on projects and published two volumes with Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution Control Board of Haryana. So that was all about our presentation. I hope you liked it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have around five hundred people in our organization. <coughs> Thank you. Sir. Okay. Thank you. So I think we have completed this technical session five. So on behalf of myself and Dr. Ashish, we thank all the speakers for their very informative and lucid presentation. And on the audience too, very receptive audience, always eager to ask questions. So online also two speakers were there. So may I request the organizers now to take over. Thank you so much, sir. Now I will request Dr. V. N. Oja to felicitate the participants. I request Dr. V. N. Oja to felicitate Professor Ravindra Agarwal. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request you to felicitate Dr. S. Johnson.
Thank you, sir. Now I request you to felicitate Dr. Richa Gupta and his. Uh, Thank you, sir. Now I request you to felicitate Mr. Ashit Ranjan from Fair Lab. Now I request Dr. Uh, Jaiswal, sir, to please um, present a vote of gratitude as a memento to Dr. V. N. Uja and Dr. Ashish Agarwal. Thank you so much, sir. Now I request you all to have lunch. Uh, in uh, Dr. A. R. Verma Lone in front of auditorium, and we will. We will back. Uh, we will hear back together at two o'clock. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I said.